Well, welcome to Cowboys for Jesus Church on this Father's Day. Actually, we have a very low crowd today. Some are having Father's Day of celebrations with their families across the state. Others are not here because they're fearful of COVID. There was an outbreak of COVID in the community, and some are fearful of that. But I just want to say I thank you for you being here. We're glad all of you are here today. And I'm going to talk today about a man who was extremely successful in his career. He was the greatest king that Israel ever had, and one of the greatest kings in all of the history of mankind. And yet, he was a poor father. Look at 1 Kings 15 and verse 5. It's a very tragic verse that we read in the Bible. <clears throat> David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except, everybody say that with me, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That's tragic. Notice it does not say except in the matter of Bathsheba. Now, in his cry of repentance, David will say, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. And in the ultimate sense, that was correct. The highest sin is against God. But the truth was, David also had sinned against his own body, according to the New Testament. He had sinned against the woman Bathsheba. But most of all, he had sinned against Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was one of his 30 mighty men. Uriah was a friend. Uriah was one who he had cut blood covenant with. And he violates that covenant in taking his wife. So that's why it says, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You know, I, I just think it's a tragic verse. All the good things that are said there about David. And how he obeyed the Lord in everything. Except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. It would be like if somebody were writing my obituary and they say, Brother Jimmy was a good pastor. He loved the people. He always studied hard so they could preach something that was helpful to them. He had a good family. And he always obeyed what the Lord told him, except in the matter concerning that woman in the little house down by the railroad tracks. That would be tragic. I'm going to speak this morning on the subject of the high cost of sinful living. But before I do, let me give a brief review of David's life. The easiest way to remember David's life is that it's built around five geographic stations and three anointings. The first geographic station is, of course, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the place of his birth, the place of his early upbringing. Bethlehem is where he kept the sheep of his father on the hills surrounding the little town. It was there on those hills that David learned to be a pastor, to be a shepherd. And all those early things in his life came from Bethlehem. And then the day came when the old prophet Samuel came to the town of Bethlehem. God had spoken to him and said that I have appointed a son among the sons of Jesse, to be king of Israel. Go and anoint him. And Samuel comes, and you remember after they went through uh, checking out all the first seven boys, and none of them were it. And he says to Jesse, do you have no other boys? He says, there's one. And he's out keeping the sheep. He says, bring him. We won't sit down until he gets here. And David comes into the room, and it says that Samuel took the horn of oil and poured it upon the head of young David. And from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. It was under that first anointing that David achieved tremendous success in his early ministry. It was under that first anointing that he killed Goliath. It was under that first anointing that he came to live in the king's palace. It was under that first anointing that he becomes the king's son-in-law. It was under that anointing that he meets Jonathan and becomes a covenant, blood covenant friend with Jonathan, the prince of the, the crown prince of Israel. And it was under that anointing that every time he went out 
into battle as one of Saul's generals. God gave him tremendous success over the enemies of God. And most of the people in Israel probably began to think, you know, old King Saul is going to retire in a couple of years. And young David will become our king. And David probably thought that too. The only problem was God knew that David was not yet ready to be king. And as the people began to sing that simple little song, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. They underestimated the insecure, jealous nature of King Saul. And so suddenly his father-in-law turns against him throws a spear at him, and David now has to flee into the wilderness of Judea. And the one who was the darling of all Israel now becomes a fugitive and an outlaw. And that brings us to the second, sta second geographic station, like the cave of Adullam. And this was his headquarters for a number of years as he ran from Saul as a fugitive. And as Andrew so ably preached a couple of weeks ago, it was in this cave. You know, it's kind of hard to go from the palace to a cave. In this cave, God begins to deal with the heart of this young king. And we're told uh, that there gathered many to him there at the cave. Can you see, da see David? Here he is now. He's no longer in the palace. He's in a cave. And he's tacking up a sign over the mouth of the cave. World Headquarters. Davidic kingship ministries. And people began to gather to him. And he became captain over them. And I'm sure he prayed as he's thinking about uh, his future ministry. Oh, Lord, send me some strong men. Send me some mighty men to help me build the kingdom. And look who God sent him. 1 Samuel 22, 2. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. And they're with him about 400. <laughs> God sent him the raw material, didn't he? He said, now here's, here's the raw material. Build mighty men out of them. And there's been many a young pastor beginning his first ministry, his first church, and tacks up that sign, World Faith Headquarters. Now, Lord, send me. Some mighty men, some great families to help me build this church. I'll tell you who God will send you every time. Everyone who's in distress. Everyone who's in debt. Everyone who's discontented. And we could add one more today. And everyone who was divorced. And God will say, here's the raw material. Build mighty men out of them. And David poured his life into those men. And they became mighty. And then the thir third stage of his life is Ziklag. Ziklag was a ph Philistine village. And we, we read in 1 Samuel 27, 1, that David became very discouraged. And he says, it looks like Saul someday will kill me and I will never be king. And so he flees from Israel into the land of the enemies of God to Ziklag. And there is a Philistine general there who he has become friends with. And so he and his men, the whole band comes with him. He and his men lived for 16 months in the land of the Philistines at Ziklag. And this becomes the low point of his life. You remember it was at Ziklag that the Amalekites made a raid on the city. And they carried off David's wives and David's sons and all of the men carried off their wives and their sons and everything they had. And it's a real low point in David's life. And it says that his men considered stoning him. But you know what the Bible says? But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Amen. And he prevailed, you remember, and everything is recovered. And then the fourth geographic station in his life is Hebron in Judea. After Saul and Jonathan die that day on the battle in Mount Gilboa, David moves back to the land of Judah and there to the, the town of Hebron. And the elders of the city come and anoint him king over Judah. This is his second anointing. And for seven and a half years, he will reign as king over the one tribe, the tribe of Judah. During this time, uh, his family grows. He has a number of more, more, many more sons and daughters that are born to him. And then the fifth geographic station is Jerusalem. And the elders of Jerusalem 
the elders of Israel will come to him. And there they will pour out an anointing upon him. I call it the Jerusalem anointing. is the third, third anointing. And he becomes now king, not just over Judah, but he becomes, becomes king over all Israel. He moves his capital to Jerusalem. And during this period of time, David becomes extremely successful. He subdues all the enemies of Israel. Uh, he experiences tremendous prosperity. He has more sons and daughters. But as Andrew preached last week, the high point of his whole life in ministry is when he brings the ark back to Jerusalem. David is saying, yes, I have so much success and all this is so good, but really it amounts to nothing without the presence of God. We've got to bring the ark back into the capital. And he brings the ark to Jerusalem, and there he places it under a tent. Not in the tent, the tabernacle of Moses. But he places it under a special tent in Jerusalem called the tabernacle of David. And for some 40 years, there will be night and day worship going on in Jerusalem at the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of Moses is still over at Gibeon, but the presence is under that tent in Jerusalem, praise God. And you, you hear all that and you say, wow, wow, what a man, what a ministry, what success. And then it happened. And so I want to talk to you now about the tragedy of the high cost of sinful living. Under these three thoughts, here they are. Sin will always take you further than you plan to go. Sin will always keep you longer than you plan to stay. And sin will always cost you more than you can afford to pay. Let's look at those in a little bit of detail. First of all, sin will always take you further than you planned to go. Look at 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 and verses 1 through 4. It says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and the servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. He has reached the point in his life in ministry where he feels like, oh, I don't really need to go out with the army anymore. I've got Joab, I've got a great army, they can take care of things. I'll just stay home here in Jerusalem. Then look what happens. And it happened... Late one afternoon, when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife, everybody say that, wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, and now she was purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. Sin will always take you further than you plan to go. I don't think David planned to commit adultery with Bathsheba. The scripture says he saw, he inquired, and then he sent. And God sends him a warning, right? Some servant said, he says, who's that? woman in the third house down the street. And they answer, oh, that's Bathsheba. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of your 30 mighty men. You can't get a better warning than that. Do you believe that sometimes when we're about to go down the wrong road, God sends us a warning? I believe that he does. And so here comes a warning to David. She is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But one thing led to another, and his sin took him further than he planned to go, and he commits adultery with Bathsheba. Folks, sin is so irrational. It's irrational. David had many beautiful wives. He also had many beautiful secondary wives called concubines. They would send couriers throughout the land of Israel looking for the most beautiful virgins to bring them so that they could be wed to the king. He's got a house full of beautiful woman, women, but it's got to be one more. 
Sin is irrational. One more. And it's the same thing with a man who's married to a very beautiful woman. And he has three beautiful children. And yet, one more. And he gets involved in an affair with another woman who may not be near as beautiful as his wife. Sin will always take you further than you plan to go. You know, I have never known anyone who became an alcoholic that said in the beginning, I think it'd not be nice to be an alcoholic. So just a few drinks, a few drinks, a few drinks, and then a few more drinks, and then somehow sin takes you further than you plan to go. We have a family that's very close to our family. Very handsome young couple. Tall man, beautiful blonde wife, several beautiful intelligent children. And yet they began to run with the jet class. They began to go to parties, drinking, 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 drinking. And then somehow the drinking began to get more and more out of hand. And then the husband began to realize, wait a minute, this is going too far. And so he cut back on his drinking. But the problem was his wife couldn't. And now they're getting a divorce. Sin will always take you further than you plan to go. I never knew anyone said, boy, it would be cool to be a drug addict. Dirty needles, cocaine, running with the most seamy people on the face of the earth. That'd be so fun. No, no, no. It never goes, happens that way. Just a little, little shot, a little high, and then another, and another, and another, and then into the world of drug addiction. Or a man who has a temper, and he's easily angered. He does not deal with his anger. It, be, it becomes more and more and more until one day he's having an argument with his wife and then he hits her and knocks her to the floor. And the next day, she walks out with the children never to return again. His sin has taken him further than he planned to go. Or, look at this. Here's a man who works for a big firm. And in the, in the office, there's an attractive woman who always dresses well. She's very friendly. He always speaks to her as he passes by her desk. And then sometimes on the break, they'll stand by the water fountain and talk. And then he invites her for a luncheon. And then the luncheons become more and more and more frequent until finally he ends up in the wrong bedroom. His sin has taken him further that he planned to go. Men, let me just give you a little warning here. If there's any woman that you enjoy talking to more than your wife, you're in trouble. Really, you are in trouble. Because that sin will take you farther than you plan to go. Second, sin will always keep you longer than you plan to stay. I'm sure after that happened, David must have said, man, how did I do that? That was so stupid. But thank God it's over now. It was just a one night stand. It'll be forgotten. That's it. Not so. One day there comes a knock at the door. He opens the door and there's a servant says, Bathsheba sent a message to you. She's pregnant. Oh no. Oh no. This thing is not going away. My sin is keeping me longer than I planned to stay. And so then, of course, you, 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 we've all been reading the Bible together. We just read this in the last week or so. You remember the scramble that he gets into then? I've got to do something about this. So the best thing to do is bring her husband Uriah home from the war and pin the pregnancy on him. So he brings Uriah home, and he begins to uh, talk to him, you know, small talk. How's the war going? How's Joab doing? All that. He said, I just thought you might like to come home for a few days of R&R, &R, R &R, go on, on down to your house. But Uriah does not go home. He sleeps on the steps of the palace. Now, was he that great of a patriot? He says, Joab and the army of God, they're all out there in the field camping in tents. How can I come home to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? Is he really that great of a patriot or does he smell a rat? So he won't go home. So David now is in panic mode. Oh my. So he throws a party for Uriah. Gets him drunk. 
Now he'll go home and he won't even know what's happening. Blame the pregnancy on him. But he won't go home. He sleeps on the steps again. So finally now in desperation, David writes a message meaning murder to Joab. And he says, put Uriah at the forefront of the fighting and then withdraw from him so that he'll die. And he sends the message back to the army, back to you, by the hand of Uriah. And you know the story how Uriah dies in battle. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. And sin will always keep you longer than you planned to stay. You know, I've heard people who have some kind of addiction say, I can quit any time. You ever heard that? I can quit any time. Well, here's a man, he begins to watch a little bit of internet porn. And then he watches more. And he gets deeper and deeper into this web of pornography. And then one day his wife looks on his computer. And then she confronts him with his sin. And he's, oh, he's so deeply repentant. Oh, honey, I promise to quit. The problem is he can't quit. Repeated offenses become habits, and habits become chains, and when you got chains on you, you're a prisoner. Sin will always keep you longer than you plan to stay. So chapter 11 ends with the thing that David had done, displeased the Lord. I guess we call that chapter 11 bankruptcy. Chapter 12 is Nathan, the prophet. And he comes to the king. You know the story of how he tells the king that parable about the poor man who had one little lamb, the rich man who has big, many, many flocks, and a guest comes to the rich man's house, and instead of taking one of his animals and preparing it for a meal, he goes and kills the lamb of the poor man. And David says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, yes, you are the man. But the beautiful thing about David is, when he's confronted with his sin, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. He takes responsibility for his sin. He repents over his sin. Unlike Saul, who when Samuel confronted him with his sin, Samuel said, oh, not, Saul said, not my fault. The people made me do it. But not David. He takes full responsibility for what he's done. He doesn't say, oh, if Bathsheba just pulled the shutter down in her bathroom, it would have never happened. He doesn't. He takes responsibility for his sin. And, and he deeply repents. I mean, you can't read that 51st Psalm. It's a, it's a compilation of, of brokenness and repentance from a heart that's absolutely shattered by what he's done. Oh, against you and you only, Lord, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. My sin is ever before me. Wash me, and I shall be clean. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Blot out my transgressions. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's a man deeply repenting. And, and Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. The Lord has forgiven you. Your relationship with God is now restored. But then he goes on to say, but you have sown some bad seed. And that bad seed is going to bring back a harvest of violence in your family. And as you begin to read the story, and we read about all the things that happened in David's family, of rape and murder and revolution, all that happening because of David's sin. So that's the third thought is sin will always cost you more than you can afford to pay. The first thing that happened because of his sin is the, chi the child of the adulterous relationship died. Second, Amnon, who is the oldest son, becomes infatuated begins to lust after his half-sister Tamar, and he re rapes her there in the palace. 
And the Bible says that David was very angry, but he does nothing to discipline Amnon. It's kind of hard to discipline your son for sexual sin when you got this right over your shoulder, what you've just done. His hands are tied because of what he's done. And then, of course, we're told that Absalom, who is Tamar's full brother, begins to seethe with anger. And his thought is, if daddy won't discipline Amnon, I will. You remember how he invites all of the king's sons to a big party? They all come, and he already told his servants, when the wine begins to flow and Amnon's heart is happy, stick the daggers in him. And so his servants ram the daggers into Amnon and kill him. And all of the sons of David flee. And the, the word that reaches David first is that Absalom has killed all the sons of the king. But then he receives the, foot, the, the true message, only Amnon has been killed by Absalom. And then Absalom flees from Jerusalem. You, you know, you can't read the story without realizing Absalom is his favorite son. No doubt about it. He is gifted. He is handsome. And David, I believe, loves him more than all the other boys. But one day when I was studying this, I began to realize that Absalom was a teenager when David committed the sin with Bathsheba. And I believe that he lost all respect for his father. And so Absalom now flees to the home of his maternal grandmother's family. And he stays there for three years. David longs for his son. And finally, he allows Absalom to return to Jerusalem. But he has to live alone. And he cannot see the king. You know what I call that? Partial forgiveness. Partial forgiveness is no good. You either forgive someone or you don't. And he says, oh, you can come back, Absalom, but you can't see me. I'm still mad at you. And so Absalom, now in Jerusalem, becomes disloyal to his father. As I said, I believe he lost all respect for his dad because as a teenager he saw what his dad did. And so now Absalom takes his place at the gate of the city of Jerusalem. And as people come in from the various regions and provinces with their complaints and their problems, and Absalom will intercept them before they can get to his father. And he'll say, oh, tell me your problem. And they'll begin to pour out their heart to Absalom, tell all, this, all, the, all the things that have happened. And here's what he would say. Well, my dad's just become too busy to pastor the people anymore. But if I were king... I would see that you received justice in your situation. And he stole the hearts of the men of Israel from his father, King David. And the day came when Absalom, this gifted, handsome son, blew the trumpet in the streets of Israel. And he raised a huge rebel army. And he begins to move against the holy city of Jerusalem and his father. And as Absalom is entering the city of Jerusalem from one side, David and a band of loyal friends flee from Jerusalem out the other side, across the Jordan River and into the wilderness. And there David begins to prepare his army for battle. He has three generals. And the last thing he says to his generals as they're marching out to war against the rebel Absalom is, Deal gently. With the young man Absalom for my sake. I know he's a rebel. I know he deserves to die. But he is my son. Deal gently with Absalom for my sake. You remember that great battle took place there. And the forces of uh, the rebel forces of Prince Absalom are defeated. And they begin to flee. And we're told that Absalom was fleeing through an oak thicket on a mule. And now Absalom had this long, long, heavy flowing hair. And as he's riding through the oak thicket, his hair tangled in the branches and the mule went on out from under him. And Prince Absalom then now is hanging by his hair suspended between heaven and earth. Uh, I was teaching a preaching class one time. And one of my students preached on the subject, the day God hung a hippie. <laughs> I told him I didn't think that was a very good title. For, for his sermon. But as he's hanging there, 
some of David's soldiers find him. But they don't raise a hand against him because they remember the king's request. Deal gently with Absalom for my sake. But he goes and tells Joab. Now Joab, is a, he is a military genius, but he's bloodthirsty to the core. He says, take me to him. And they take Joab to him, and he takes three darts and throws them into the heart of Absalom and takes his life. And so David now returns to the city of Jerusalem, victorious as a king, but brokenhearted as a father. And you can hear him as he, he, is, as he approaches the city. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, would to God that I had died instead of thee. And if you were to slip up beside King David at that moment and say, David, what in the world is going on? I'll tell you what he'd say. My sin is costing me more than I can afford to pay. I finish with one last story. I call it the Al Thielman story. Ronnie, you and Glenda will know this story. You were there when it happened. Al Thielman was a young man who got saved in our church at San Marcos. He'd come out of the drug world and got radically saved and uh, began to grow in the Lord. And uh, he married one of the sweet girls in our church named Mary. And uh, Al and I did a lot of hunting together. He was a good shotgun shot. And we hunted quail with my dogs on the hills around San Marcos. I still have one of Al's guns that he gave to me. And so we had a great time hunting. Also, Al was a part of a discipleship group of young men that I was discipling. And we, me we memorized together a big part of the book, book of Romans. And so he's growing in the Lord. He has a beautiful wife. Now he has two sons. He becomes a deacon in the church. And then I moved to Pensacola, Florida to Pastor Liberty Church for, for Brother Ken Summerall. And during the years that I was gone, Al's heart moved away from the Lord. And he began to get back into that world of cocaine and drugs. He began to chase prostitutes. He got into the world of gambling. And it wasn't too long until he had a quarter million dollar debt to the mafia. And he's afraid. He's scared for his life. He's afraid they're going to kill him. And so now in his cocaine crazed fearful mind, he comes up with this plan. He took out a million dollar insurance policy on Mary, his wife. And he put her and the children on an airplane to fly to Iowa to see their parents. And in one of the children's suitcase, he put a bomb. Fortunately, the bomb went off when the plane was on the ground in Dallas. It tore up the whole baggage department. Think what it would have happened at 30,000 feet. It didn't take the FBI long to figure out whose suitcase that bomb was in. And so they began to pursue Al. And they began to find out about his double life. His church life, faithful in church. He's a deacon. He's an usher at the church. And yet, he has another side to him. That the FBI has, FBI has discovered. And uh, Al actually had the audacity to go before the church and say, I'm being falsely accused by the law enforcement. Please pray for me. But the FBI knew they had their man. And they arrested him. And he was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in a federal penitentiary. Never again would he hunt quail on the hills around San Marcos with his pastor. Never again would he see his boys play little league foot, uh, uh, baseball. Never again would he hold the wife of his youth in his arms. And I can promise you, if you had slipped into that prison, right up beside Al Philman and said, Al, what in the world is going on? I'll tell you what he'd tell you. My sin is costing me more than I can afford to pay. Folks, listen, we don't fool with sin. It's a dead serious thing. And it will always take you further than you plan to go. It will always keep you longer than you plan to stay. And it will always cost you more than you can afford to pay. Let's pray. That's kind of a hard-hitting sermon on Father's Day. I know that.
But it's the truth, right? It's the truth. So Father, I pray now for everyone here. I particularly pray for the dads today. That we would say, we're going to stay away from that thing called sin. We're not going to play around with it. We're not going to touch it. We're going to walk with the Lord. We're going to walk in holiness. We're going to walk in purity. Lord, I pray that for every man in this room. I pray for any, Lord, who is struggling right now with some area of sin in their life. And it's already taken them further than they plan to go. And it's keeping them longer than they plan to stay. They can't get loose from it. I pray, my God, that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day of release. That today would be the day of deliverance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, I think, Miss Elizabeth, we're ready. <clears throat> I think I left you enough time. Amen. We don't. <laughs> Pastor Jimmy did say that was a tough sermon, but we don't want to shy away from tough things. We want the Lord, we want his blessings, and we want the Lord to pour out his spirit upon us. And we can't have none of that junk in us and expect the Lord to bless us. And so praise God for his word and praise God for truth. And so now we do want to transition over to what we have planned for Father's Day as Elizabeth leads a band of kids <laughs> as they come over here. If everybody has your ticket, we're going to raffle off some of the prizes, doing things a little different this year like we did for Mother's Day. Uh, if you do win a prize, if we call your number, come up and stay up here. Um, and after everybody has received their prize, stay up here, and then we're going to call all the fathers to come forward, and we're going to pray for all the dads. And we have some, I'm, I'm a, you know, uh, on Mother's Day, we give out flowers and things, and I told Elizabeth this year, you know, I'm a dad, and I like to eat things, <laughs> and I can't eat a flower, or, <laughs> and so, or a handkerchief, and so we have some, uh, some cookies, and so we're excited about that. So, Elizabeth? Here we go. So I have more tickets. Did every dad get a ticket? Did every dad, does every, da John, you got a ticket? Good job. Okay, everybody has a ticket? Then I'm not going to give out any more tickets. Miss Beth, can you come up here and help me draw for prizes? So let me tell you, our first prize is a fishing voucher to go fishing with Captain Jimmy. So, Miss Beth, that belongs to uh, Carter. This is his ticket. Just hold it in your hand. Let's go down the line and pick a ticket for each kid. The Shiatsu Massager, a basket of fun, a f charcuterie board, a beautiful fish. I almost kept that for myself. Then I said, well, I am buying presents for Father's Day. Okay, so our fifth place prize, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, yes, is this beautiful cross that Emily's holding. It has a handy-dandy universal socket. How many of you own this handy-dandy universal socket? Ricky, of course, Ricky, Robert, of course. There's another one. I even own one of these because it is my long-lost friend. This universal socket, you've seen it on TV, has a bunch of little beads in it, and it will fit any size nut bolt head whether it's metric or whether it's standard uh, so it's a one-shot tool so i keep it in my car because you just never know i had a flat tire in my neighborhood i know you're not going to believe this and the man that stopped to help me could not turn the the rent the wrench that jacks up the jack and i said oh, hold on i got a trusty tool to help you with that and reached in my car, got my trusty tool, and we jacked up my car with it. It also has some uh, beef jerky, three different flavors of beef jerky. And the winner of this beautiful prize is ticket number 548. Last three numbers, 548. Raise your hand, 548. 
Last three numbers, five, four, eight. How's that possible? How's that? Oh, they could have left. Where's the bucket? Oh, I put it right behind you, Miss Emily. Emily, Scotty's daughter, and she used to go to Bullseye here when she was just a little girl. She just graduated from high school, so she's a graduating senior. Next ticket, 512. 512, last three numbers. Miss Clark, bring, Clark, bring your ticket, Clarky. Here you go, stand with Miss Emily. I'm gonna keep the bucket just in case we need it. Here, make sure he has that and he's not lying. Uh, the next one is ticket number 552. As I said, this is a wood and pewter fish because I went with the fish thing theme since Captain Jimmy's taking you all on a fishing trip. It's got some beef jerky and cheese and another universal socket set. 552. Charles in charge. There he comes. Come on, Charles. Did you mention that this young lady got a full ride scholarship to Texas Lutheran College? Oh, Miss Emily got a full ride scholarship to Texas Lutheran College. <laughs> Charles, this one's yours. Give her your ticket. Okay, did you give me your ticket already? Oh, 552. Five, this is your ticket. Hold that ticket. No, they can sit down. This ticket. This ticket. There you go. Okay. This basket is just a basket. Oh, you can go sit down. This basket is just a basket of fun. It's a, got a beautiful contemporary cross. It's made out of wood and pewter. A grill cleaner. This is my grill basket. It's got some, a big bag of taffy, a grill a cleaner, some beef jerky, and a mitt that says, grill, eat, chill, repeat. So whoever's going to use this, I'll give you my number afterwards. <laughs> Ticket winner, 540. Yeah. Yeah. There there What's your name? Dan, Dan, welcome. Get up here and claim your basket. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right here. Stay here. Oh, oh, yeah, Dan, you can't leave so early. You can sit down, baby. Uh, next, next prize is this beautiful shiatsu neck massager. This is the one, what's your ticket number, Andrew? We'll call it out. Uh, ticket number 511. The whoever walked in before, here he comes, 511. Okay, hand him his prize. And we'll wait for everybody to come up here before we read this big one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we trust you. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you for thank you for helping. Uh, the next, this is our big prize. It comes with a, a Cowboys for Jesus. Uh, let me let me skip that out of the way. Cowboys for Jesus. Uh, what do you call this thing? Ice chest with a couple of koozies on one side. It has a Cowboys for Jesus logo. On the other side, it has a Captain Jimmy logo. Uh huh, Captain Jimmy. <laughs> It's got uh, some cedar plank boards for the fish you're going to catch with them. So you can cook it on the grill. It's got a bag of peanuts. It's got a Gatorade. It's got a water, bottle of water, some beef jerky, everything you need to go fishing with. And you'll have to coordinate your fishing trip with Captain Jimmy. Ticket number five, one, six. Oh, John Beaver did get it. John said before church, John said before church, he wanted to win that. And look, he said he was going to win it. Come on. He did. Okay. Oh, well. And um, because we, we have to. Oh, this is for Pastor Andrew. It's also a Cowboys for Jesus reject lunchbox. And this is for Pastor Jimmy. Come on, Pastor Jimmy, get up here. It uh, has a Cowboys for Jesus logo on one side and the Captain Jimmy logo on the other. Okay. Hey, man, now I want to invite all the dads to come forward. We want to pray a special blessing. We want to thank the Lord for our dads. I want to thank the Lord for all the men that came to boot camp as well. We had a great time. God is doing great things in the lives of the men of our church. <laughs> I 
Elizabeth, we can pass out the cookies after we pray. <laughs> Squeeze in together, pretend you like each other. We got plenty of room to bring people over. <laughs> all right. We're so thankful for um, all the men in our church. And men, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord, uh, may his face shine upon you and prosper you as you lead your families, as we try to draw closer to the Lord. May the Lord pour out his spirit abundantly upon you because the things you do as dad, as grandpa, as, as husband, they matter and they echo throughout eternity. And uh, there is a huge problem in our country with lack of dads. And we're so thankful to have dads here. And we want dads uh, who follow after Jesus and who will affect not just your kids and your wives, but the generations that follow you. And so we want to be, we want to learn from David's example and do the opposite of what he did with his family. We want to pursue the Lord that blessings would follow in all of your families. So if everybody that's sitting out there, raise your hands towards the dads and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the men in our church. Lord, we thank you for the dads that we have here, Lord. Father, we just pray your blessing upon them, Lord. As each man here is a, is a priest in his home, Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit mightily upon him, Lord, that he could lead his family, uh, lead his wife, lead his children, his grandchildren, and all of his descendants, Lord, to seek after you, Lord. Give him special grace and strength to accomplish the job that you have given him, Lord. Lord, and let him do it with joy and love and mercy. Lord, you call us as husbands to love our wives as you love the church, Lord. So make us like you, Lord Jesus. That if Jesus was standing there as the dad, as the husband, as the grandpa, Lord, that we would act like that, Lord. And that you would just pour out your spirit upon these men, Lord. Lord, I pray blessing upon them. I pray that you strengthen them, Lord, and that you make them brave and bold, Lord, for the kingdom, Lord. And that they boldly serve and love their wives and their kids and their grandkids, Lord. And anybody else they come in contact with, Lord, uh, that this would be a place where the men in this place, Lord, love you and seek you with their whole hearts, Lord. Lord, we pray um, for all the families that are represented here, Lord. We pray a blessing on the kids and the wives as well, Lord Jesus. And we praise you and we thank you for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Men, don't forget your cookies. There are cookies. Uh, George, would you grab that? George, would you grab that whole thing and put it over there on the chair so that way men grab your cookies? And with that, we are dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and bring you back safely for the next service. God bless you. See you next week.